me just do a little bit of recap here. So last week, we introduced what covenant theology is. If you weren't here last week or you weren't able to tune in, we have that on video. You can catch up on your own time if you haven't already. Uh, And what we said was that covenant theology, just as a definition, is the gospel set in the context of God's eternal plan of communion with his people and it's the historical outworking of the covenants of works and grace. Now, these covenants here, as we said last week, are two of the three overarching covenants that are affirmed by covenant theology. We have the covenant of works, the covenant of grace, and what we're gonna be discussing today, the covenant of redemption. Let me just give you a little, uh, we'll just keep working by way of recap. When we're talking about the covenant of works, who was the covenant of works made with? Anybody remember? Missy, I'm gonna throw you off the ledge first. Between God and whom? No, try again. Covenant of works. There you go. All right, so God makes a covenant with Adam and with Adam's posterity, that's all of us, all of humanity, in which God will confer upon Adam and his offspring blessings of eternal life for obedience or the curse of eternal death for disobedience. We're gonna get into all those weeds next week, okay? Covenant of grace, immediately promised there in Genesis 3, unfolded over the course of the Bible, is God's covenant then with his elect, which he promises salvation through faith in Christ. God has always saved his elect the same way. There's not two ways of salvation, an Old Testament way and a New Testament way. It's always been by faith through Christ. And Christ is the one who merited their salvation by obedience to the covenant of redemption. So we'll put it this way. The covenant of works with Adam created the need and the conditions for redemption. The covenant of grace is what Christ provided, uh, is what Christ provided in terms of what was needed for redemption. Let me just draw it out here for you. So we've got Genesis. By the way, here's just an easy way to think about the Bible. We've got Genesis 1 to Genesis let's say 11, and then we'll go, uh, let's say Genesis 12, all the way to Malachi, all the way to Revelation, okay? From here to here, you've got the kingdom of creation, Then beginning with the covenant to Abraham, first revealed in Genesis 12, again in 15, again in 17, again in 22, you have, we'll put Abe here, then Moses, David, three big covenants, Abrahamic covenant, Mosaic covenant, that is a covenant made with Abraham's people Israel and with King David, okay? These are the three main covenants that stretch across the kingdom of Israel. And then you have beginning in Matthew, beginning in the New Testament, really it begins at the crucifixion, so it's a little bit false to say it begins at the beginning of Matthew, but as soon as Christ has laid down his life, a new covenant is ratified, and you have now in the New Testament, the kingdom, I forgot how to spell, kingdom of Christ. Okay, so three kingdoms. God is in covenant with all of Uh, with all of humanity in general ways, and he's in covenant with particular peoples in, uh, in unique ways, okay? And in each way, God's kingdom comes through covenant, a covenant of works. Then we're gonna see this whole section right here is what is referred to in your Bible as the old covenant. That's the old covenant, first established with Abraham, expanded on in Moses, and then narrowed in David, specifically related to the king as a federal head over the nation. And then you have here what is typically referred to as the new covenant. That makes sense? So I know this phrase gets talked about a lot, and a lot of people think when we're talking about the old covenant, we're talking about the Mosaic covenant, and that's true in one sense, but really what we're talking about in the old covenant is everything, all the physical promises that are temporary uh, as opposed to eternal, that are uh, based on a physical people as opposed to a spiritual people, those are all, beginning with Abraham through Moses and David to the 
uh, ratification of the new covenant, that's the old covenant. And what we said last time is all throughout this, you have shadows, mystery of Christ, right? Christ is being gradually revealed. Mystery is in a way of hiding everything. Mystery is a way of revealing something, but only in part, okay? So what you have is Christ revealed as a mystery. You've got the mystery of Christ. Beginning in Genesis 3, first revealed. Genesis 3, what's the promise of Christ that we see? He's identified as who? He's the seed of the woman. And what's he gonna do? He's gonna crush the serpent's head. So who is this seed? Who's gonna do it? It's a mystery, partially revealed. And it gets revealed a little bit more as beginning in Genesis 3, all the way through the Old Testament until we get to the incarnation life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So we've got the mystery of Christ, and then the apostolic testimony is explaining the mystery of Christ being fully revealed in the incarnation, person, and work of Christ. Okay? Okay, so there's just kind of your whole Bible in one snapshot. Three kingdoms all brought about through covenant, the old covenant and the new covenant, and the mystery of Christ hidden and yet partially revealed until fully revealed at his coming. Any questions about any of that? You good with that? Okay, that's not the main meat of today. I'm just trying to set the table. Anybody, you guys all online, any questions with that? Are you good? You can go ahead and talk. We can hear you if you unmute. Any questions on any of that? Okay, so Genesis 1 and 2. God enters into a covenant of works with Adam. It has conditions, the responsibilities that he is supposed to fulfill. He is to exercise dominion, rule over the earth as a vice regent in the place of God. And God has given him a command, not only written the law in his own heart, as is true of all of those who are in Adam and come afterwards. That's Paul's point in Romans 2. Gentiles do uh, they obey the law even though they don't have the law. Why? Because they're in Adam. All, the law has been written on everybody's hearts because they're in the image of God. So the covenant of works is made and he sets a condition. Uh, responsibilities, tend the garden, exercise dominion, all those kinds of things. That's Genesis 1. Then Genesis 2, he gives his law in the form of a command. You remember the command? What is the command that God gives to Adam? Okay, you can eat of any tree in the garden. It's all yours. You just can't eat of one. Tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in the day you do it, in Hebrew it says, you will die, die. Dying, you will die. It's an emphatic, more than just spiritual death. David's messing with them. It's more than just spiritual death. So the conditions are, if you obey, the tree of life is yours, and eternal life belongs to you and all those who would come from you. If you disobey, then death comes to you and sin and death spread to all men, Romans 5, okay? We'll get into all of that next week. That's the covenant of works. But then you get to Genesis 3 and you have the first revelation of the covenant of grace. Specifically, Genesis 3.15 in what some people call the proto- Evangelion, the first, take a stab. Close. Va at the heart of evangelism is what? Is the gospel. It's the first gospel, Genesis 3.15. Okay, so the covenant of grace has been revealed. The mystery of Christ has been revealed. And then through the various covenants, Abraham, Moses, and Israel, and David, This covenant of grace is revealed the way the confession puts it, 1689 confession, in further steps. Okay? It means that every step of the way, a little bit more is revealed about how it is that God is going to go about saving his people, his elect, the means by whereby he's going to do it, how he's going to do it, who's going to fulfill it, and you've got promises that are revealed through each one of these covenants. But all of them are ultimately pointing, none of these are in fact the covenant of grace, but they are all ultimately revealing in further steps like a, like a, like a flower that's opening up until it's fully revealed in the new covenant. Ooh, that, 
That didn't work. In the new covenant, and that new covenant is the covenant of grace. So you see the covenant of grace is in line with the mystery of Christ, as we talked about, further revealed more and more and more through each one of these uh, covenants, and each one of these covenants have physical and temporary promises that serve as types or shadows, that's what we talked about last week, that ultimately find their fulfillment in the antitype, that is Christ, and the substance, that is what Christ, who Christ is and what he has accomplished, okay? And all of that is in the new covenant. So when we say, let me say that, look back at that first intro and recap, that covenant theology is all about the historical outworking of the covenant of works and of grace, this is what we mean. Covenant of works, all of humanity is condemned. Sin is spread to all, death is spread to all because of Adam's sin. But there was a promise in Genesis 3.15 and that promise was a promise of a covenant of grace further revealed in further steps until it was fulfilled in the new covenant in Christ. Okay, covenant of works, covenant of grace, all through the Bible. And we understand it typologically as we talked about last week and through kind of shadows and substance, always pointing forward to its fulfillment. Any questions on this? Just this part right here. Yeah, Mike. Is it, is it safe to say that like covenant of grace and new covenant are somewhat synonymous? Covenant of grace, the new covenant is the covenant of grace. That's right. Now, when we get into the covenant of grace, not next week, but next uh, two weeks from now, what we're gonna see is that our Presbyterian friends in the book that you're reading are gonna disagree with me on this. And we'll get into the weeds on that. They view, yes, the new covenant is the covenant of grace, but that covenant of grace has two outward administrations in the Abrahamic covenant and in the new covenant. Same covenant of grace, two administrations. That's why they would say the Abrahamic covenant is made to, uh, to believers and their children. It's why they, our Presbyterian friends understand the church, just like Israel, to be a mixed community made up of both unregenerate and regenerate. Well, Baptist covenantalists, Baptist covenant theology, believes that the Abrahamic covenant isn't, in fact, the covenant of grace, but that the covenant of grace is further revealed and promised in the Abrahamic covenant until it finds its fulfillment in the one and only covenant of grace, the new covenant, which is why we would understand a greater discontinuity between Israel and the church than our Presbyterian friends would. But all of the furnitures in the house, same furniture, just arranged a little bit differently. Does that make sense? We'll get into all of that in a couple of weeks because that's a really important distinction. Okay, the big thing that you need to understand is the covenant of works affects everybody at all times until Jesus comes back, okay? Because it's everybody's in Adam. The covenant of grace is gradually revealed, first promise in Genesis 3, until it's fully revealed in the new covenant in Christ. Where then does the covenant of redemption play? And the answer is the covenant of redemption is the blueprint for every other covenant. The covenant of redemption, we'll put it up here, is that eternal, pre-temporal agreement between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, whereby the Son will become, agree to become a second Adam and succeed in every way that the first Adam failed, thus reversing the covenant of works and will fulfill all of the promises first revealed in Genesis 3, then also in Abraham, Moses, and David, as they've been revealed typologically through shadows. Uh, he ultimately is the substance. So the covenant of grace is the covenant of redemption in history. Does that make sense? The covenant of redemption is the covenant of grace in eternity. That's how they're related. The covenant of redemption is the covenant of grace in eternity. The covenant of grace is the covenant of redemption in history as it works itself out in time and space over the course of redemption, redemptive history. Any questions on all of that? Now listen, we're gonna spend the rest of our time just on this. We'll get to this next week and we'll get to that the following week and then the rest of our time, we'll be walking one by one through each one of these biblical covenants to show how they just flower up toward the fulfillment in Christ in the new covenant. David. Is there somebody that you listen to a lot or someone that you look up to that kind of helps you through some of these concepts? 
Yeah, there's a, lot, there's a whole lot of resources out there written by uh, Baptist covenant theologians. Um, and there's some variations in the way that they write and teach. I've got some stuff in the back. I can show it to you afterwards. Uh, but you've got guys like Sam Rinehan, uh, guys like Sam Waldron, um, lots of really good authors that are out there. Uh, Greg Nichols has been really good. There's a book that was just released recently uh, by an old particular Baptist, Nehemiah Cox, and just showing how he and John Owen have essentially the same covenant theology. And so even though John Owen was a Pado baptist his theology was essentially the same as what we've articulated here. And so John Owen seems to reject the idea that the covenant of grace is one covenant, two outward administrations, Abrahamic and new, and rather it's fulfilled ultimately in the new. So there's lots of good resources out there. The reason that I had you read the book that you're reading, even though it's written by a Presbyterian and we're Baptists, is because they do such a good job simplifying complex things. Their definitions are so on point. Uh, their expositions of certain passages are, are really, really good. And so really what's gonna happen is we're gonna get to the Abrahamic covenant and I'm gonna go, I love these guys, I just think they're wrong here. And then we'll walk through what I think is a more biblical understanding of the Abrahamic covenant in relation to the new. So, but it's good to know what, what they think, okay? So that's why I had it. Honestly, here's the other reason that I didn't have you read uh, particular Baptists or uh, Baptist covenant theologians. It's because um, Baptist covenant theology in its packaging tends to have a kind of a little brother, little, like little guy complex. You've got this big massive tradition among Presbyterian and reform types on covenant theology and Baptist covenant theology just seems so concerned to prove that they are in fact reformed. And so their works tend to not really present a positive case in the way that the book that you're reading does. It tends to be more polemical, arguing against something on what, you know, so it's arguing for credo baptism as opposed to pedo baptism. Um, and I'm not interested so much in getting into those weeds in these eight weeks. I want to present the case as, positive, as positively as I can, and I think Brown and Keel do a really good job, even though they're wrong on the Abrahamic covenant. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, you bet. David just asked what resources uh, I'd recommend and uh, you heard those, uh, but uh, yeah, that's, that's good. Okay, so we are past all of that. That's just the big picture. We're talking about covenant of redemption. The covenant of redemption is the covenant of grace in eternity and the covenant of grace is the covenant of redemption in history. What exactly is it? You've got a couple of definitions there. From the Second London Baptist Confession, 1689, it says this, it pleased God in his eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus, his only begotten son, according to the covenant made between them both, to be the mediator between God and man, the prophet, priest, and king, head and savior of the church, heir of all things, and judge of the world, unto whom he did from all eternity give a people to be his seed, and to be by him in time redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. If you want to put it a little bit shorter, uh, I've got Brown and Keel there. A couple other definitions. Louis Burkhoff, uh, early 20th century Reformed theologian, says this. It is the agreement between the Father giving the Son as head and redeemer of the elect and the Son voluntarily taking the place of those whom the Father has given him. That's helpful, but it only has two of the three persons of the Trinity mentioned. I think a more faithful definition would have all three. So J.J. Vanderschut says this, a mutual undertaking of the three divine persons to stand guarantee in the attainment of salvation of those who are chosen by God for etern eternal life. And then you've got the definition from Brown and Keel, which to be honest with you, I think is the best one. It's the covenant established in eternity between the Father who gives the Son to be the Redeemer, that's S-O-N, to be the Redeemer, the elect, and requires of Him the conditions for the redemption, for their redemption. You can tell I did all of this through voice command into my computer. In the Son who voluntarily agreed to fulfill those conditions and the Spirit who voluntarily applies the work of the Son to the elect. 
Some of you may remember in your reading that John Owen described the covenant of redemption as having five major elements. Do you remember this part of your reading? Number one, he said you had the father as the promiser. You remember that? The father is the promiser, the son is the undertaker, who voluntarily agrees together in counsel to achieve a common purpose. That purpose is the glory of God in the salvation of the elect. Number two, that the Father has prescribed the conditions for this covenant. He's the one that has ultimately said what's gonna be required of the Son. And that is consisting of the Son assuming human nature, fulfilling the demands of the law, and suffering the just judgment of God for the elect in order to satisfy God's judgment on their behalf. Thirdly, the, 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 the father also promised the son that he would support him. I'm gonna help you do this. And that consists of uh, that if the son accomplishes the work given to him, that he would achieve salvation and glorification for the elect. The father has confirmed all of these promises with an oath, he says. Fourthly, the son voluntarily accepted the conditions and assumed the work as surety of the covenant Surety is just a guarantee. And fifthly, the father approved and accepted the performance of the son who likewise laid claim to the promises made in the covenant. Don't worry about remembering that. That's just a good overview. We're gonna just slowly work through some of that in the course of the next hour or so. But the big question is, great, so, the th so Reformed theology talks about this, the systematic theologians talk about this, there's books upon books upon books, but does the Bible teach it? At the end of the day, Reformed theology is useless if it's not ultimately robustly biblical. Can we find it in the Bible? If we can't, we need to reject it. And a lot of Baptists have. They don't believe that the covenant of redemption can be found in the Bible, but it's my aim to persuade you otherwise and then to apply it at the end of our time on why this is important. So some claim that the covenant of redemption is in the Bible. But listen to what 20th century Reformed Baptist A.W. Pink has to say. Let it be pointed out that as there is no one verse in the Bible which expressly affirms that there are three divine persons in the Godhead, co-eternal, co-equal, co-glorious, nevertheless, by carefully comparing Scripture with Scripture, we know this is the case. Of course, he's responding to, the, to those like Unitarians or Sicinians that would say, well, the Bible never teaches the Trinity and never uses the word Trinity, so it can't teach it. He says, well, when we look at the whole Bible and we do whole Bible theology, we see that the Bible does, in fact, teach Trinity. In like manner, he says, there is no single verse in the Bible which categorically states that the Father entered into a formal agreement with the Son and that on his executing a certain work, he should receive a certain reward. That's right. Nevertheless, a careful study of different passages obliges us to arrive at this conclusion. What A.W. Pink is doing is he is warning us against the dangers of what some people would term biblicism. It's the idea of of needing particular proof text in order to make your point without any regard to what the church has historically confessed, okay? It's kind of a me, my Bible, and the Holy Spirit way to do theology. When in the reality is, is that we wanna do whole Bible theology. We wanna make connections from one cover to the other, and then out of those connections draw out good and necessary implications for our for our theology, and we do that on everything. We do that not only on the Trinity, there's no one verse that says that God is Trinity, co-eternal, co-glorious, and yet when we compile all of the biblical data and begin to draw out those inferences, we go, God is gloriously triune. That the Son is equal with the Father and the Spirit is equal with the Son and the Father, and they are one God uh, for all of eternity. So, is it in there? Well, my hope over the course of the next few minutes is to do whole Bible theology with you guys. And that once we get to the end, you will never be able to unsee what you've seen in the Bible concerning the covenant of redemption. But when did it take place? So does the Bible teach it? I think it does, but we've gotta do whole Bible theology. But when did it take place? The covenant of redemption is eternal and pre-temporal. When I say pre-temporal, what do I mean? Pre is prior to, before. Temporal refers to what? 
to time. It's before time. It's before creation. Time, of course, being something that, the, that God has created. It is pre-temporal. Just listen to these. I've listed a number of passages there that you can go look at on your own. Uh, we'll look at some passages at length. Others we're just gonna make reference to. Ephesians 3.11, we see there that Paul unfolds the mystery of the, quote, eternal purpose that God has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what he says. 2 Timothy 1.9, that God has, quote, saved us and called us. He says he's done so to a holy calling, not because of our works, he says, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us before the ages began. Uh-oh. It's almost uncomfortably Calvinistic. Titus 1.2, eternal life was something, quote, which God promised before the ages began. First Peter 1, 18 and 19, we read there the believers were redeemed, quote, with the precious blood of Christ, who was, quote, foreknown before the foundations of the world, but was made manifest now for you. Revelation 13, 8, the apostle John follows in the same train of thought by perceiving the redeemer as a lamb that is, quote, slain, and get this, before the foundation of the world. Whoa, wait a minute. Is John saying what we think he's saying? That atonement, this lamb and the atonement that he would make was in fact a reality before the foundation of the world. Well, if that's the case, how do we go about explaining that? And the answer is the covenant of redemption. So who are the parties? We've already made mention of it. The parties in the covenant of redemption are God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open up to Psalm 40. You've already read some of this in your chapter this week, and so I hope this is a good reminder, a good refresher for you, but it's a key text in terms of thinking about the covenant of redemption. Psalm 40. The psalm written by David in verses one through five, we see that David is offering praise. First few verses, he's praising God for rescuing him. Then in verses four and five, he's declaring then that the one who trusts in the Lord is, verse four, the blessed man, the blessed man. But then in verses six through eight, listen to the statement that David makes. In sacrifice and offering, you have not delighted but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, behold, I have come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is written in my heart. So here in verses six through eight, David makes a statement about the proper relationship between the Lord and the one who trusts in the Lord. What does this God-honoring trust look like? Well, David says it looks like heart-level obedience to God's word, not to ceremonial sacrifices. And when it talks about sacrifices, we should understand that, burnt offering and sin offering, specifically having to do with the ceremonial law given to Moses. That's why it's burnt offerings and sin offerings and all of those. But God wants something more than that. But what exactly is happening here? Turn to your right all the way close to the end of your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. In chapters 7 all the way through 9 in, in, the, in the book of Hebrews, the writer has been arguing that in Christ, a new and better covenant has replaced the old covenant. It was an inferior covenant. And when we say that it was an inferior covenant, we don't mean that it was inferior in the sense that it was bad. We mean that it was inferior in the sense that it was a shadow, in the way that a shadow is inferior to substance, in the way that a type is inferior to its antitype. Its antitype is always bigger and greater and more glorious. And when the antitype comes, the type isn't needed anymore. When the substance is here, the shadows cease to be needed. And so this is the argument that the writer is making, chapter seven, eight, and nine. And you see at the beginning of chapter 10 that he's picking up on this idea, for since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come 
instead of the true form of these realities. See what we're talking about? Shadow and substance. Inferior, superior. It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. They can't do it, he says. So why is it that God doesn't desire these sacrifices? Because they can't ultimately accomplish what God is setting out to accomplish. Verse two, otherwise they wouldn't have ceased to be offered since the worshipers having once been cleansed would no longer have any consciousness of sins. In other words, he's saying, why do they have to keep being offered if they were efficacious for the removal of sins? And the answer was, though they removed sins in one sense, there was a, there's another way in which they didn't. They removed it according to the stipulations of the Mosaic Covenant so that God would continue to dwell with them and keep them in the land, but ultimately couldn't give them a pure conscience. And so he says in verse three, but these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. They just don't do the job. Verse four, for it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So why does God not want outward sacrifices? It's because Israel's ceremonial sacrifices were, verse one, shadows of the good things to come. What are the good things to come? Namely, verse four, the remission or the removal of sin. They couldn't do it. They were pointing to something greater than themselves that would. And then look at the very next verse. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, when he was incarnate, actually not when he was incarnate, I'm sorry, in the way that John meets it, when the word came in the Old Covenant, present in the Old Testament, when Christ came, this is what he said. Tell me if this sounds familiar. Sacrifices and offerings you've not desired, but a body you've prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sin offerings you've taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I've come to do your will, O God, as is written of me in the scroll of the book. Where do we see that? At Psalm 40. Look back at verse five. Who does the writer to the Hebrews under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit say, said those words? Christ did. So which is it? Did David say it? Or did Christ say it? True, yes, both. You've got one David speaking and you've got a true and better David speaking, both at the same time. It is, it is one David speaking on behalf of another David through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so here we see in verses five through 10, it's gonna have two parts. In the verses that we just read, five, six, and seven, what we have is Old Testament anticipation. But in verses eight, nine, and 10, we're gonna have apostolic interpretation. He's gonna make sense of what's going on. So when he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I've come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. The first being the old covenant, the second being the new covenant. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. See the argument that's being made? Those who draw near with bulls and goats cannot be cleansed. They can't be sanctified in this way. But those who have trusted in Christ are sanctified because he is ultimately the one to whom the old covenant was pointing. The author identifies Christ as the speaker of these words. And what's significant for our purposes is to notice that if these are Christ's words, then who is he talking to? The answer, of course, that I'm gonna to submit to you is that these are Christ's loyal words to the Father as he submitted himself to the covenant of redemption in order to do away with the old covenant and establish the covenant of grace the covenant of redemption in history. So the parties in this covenant of redemption include the Father and the Son, that much is clear from Psalm 40. But the question is, where's the Spirit? I don't see no Spirit in there. Where's He? Well, turn back in your Bibles to Isaiah 42. This is right in the heart of Isaiah's servant songs. Okay, of all of the servant songs, they're all dealing with the servant of Jehovah, the servant of Yahweh, the one who will be sent by God, ultimately Messiah. Psalm 42, the servant songs. Verse 
And I want you to pay attention as we're in it because what we're gonna see is that these verses that we have here, what they're gonna do is they're gonna describe the servant of Jehovah, the spirit of Jehovah, and Jehovah himself. That's the Lord, the spirit of the Lord, and the servant of the Lord, okay? Just see if you can identify them. Verse one, behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit who walk in it. I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you and I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and from the prison, those who sit in darkness." When you look at Isaiah 49, 8 and 9, these verses are just repeated practically verbatim, so we're not going to go there. But I want you to notice in verses 1 through 4, or just, by the way, we've got, who do we have? We've got verse 5, the Lord. We've got verse 1, the servant of the Lord. And we've got, in verse 1, the spirit of the Lord. All three of them present in the same passage. The verses 1 through 4 now we see that God is presenting his servant to us. Here he is. And then in verses five through seven, God speaks to his servant. And notice what he tells his servant in verse six, that he will give him. He's gonna give him as a covenant for the people and a light for the nations. That is, the nations are gonna come in through him. He is ultimately gonna become the gate, as he teaches of himself later in John chapter 10. The gate through which all of the nations might come into the new Jerusalem. That is, the redeemed people of God. He says, I'm gonna give you as a covenant for the people and a light for the nations. And then he tells them in verse seven that this servant is gonna end up fulfilling his mission and that mission is ultimately to give spiritual sight to the blind, it's to free those who are in bondage, and it is to bring light to those who are in darkness. But how is it that this servant is going to accomplish this mission? Well, verse two explains to us how he's empowered for this. It says here that I will put my spirit upon him. This is a common theme in Isaiah. For instance, you don't have to go there, but if you were to go back to Isaiah chapter 11, it's a messianic part of Isaiah. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, talking about Messiah, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. That's the regenerated, redeemed people of God. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. He's going to be empowered and anointed by the spirit to accomplish this mission, which is why when you turn over to Isaiah chapter 50, the servant is now speaking and he's able to say, beginning in verse four, the Lord has given me the tongue of those who are taught. That the Lord has opened my ear. He's saying the Lord God, Yahweh, Jehovah is helping me. But seven, the Lord God helps me. Verse nine, behold the Lord God helps me. How is it that the Lord God is helping the servant, that is Messiah, in his mission, this agreed upon mission between the Lord and the servant? And the answer is he puts his spirit upon him. And so here in this passage, what we're ultimately seeing is that the Father and the Son, just as in Psalm 40, are presented as the primary parties, but the Spirit is everywhere present. And it's the Spirit of Jehovah, the Spirit of the Lord, that's going to equip and sustain the servant of Jehovah in his mission. And we'll get into a little bit of that in just a second. But here we have the Scriptures portraying, in kind of a mode of a covenant, an intra-Trinitarian dialogue between the Father and the Son and the Spirit concerning the redemption of an elect people. Okay, so here we've got, we've just 
now talked about who are the parties of a covenant. Every covenant has parties. Every covenant also has requirements. What are the requirements? We're gonna breeze through these and then we're gonna look a little bit more in depth at a couple of passages. Requirements. That the Father required Christ to become surety and covenant head of his people as the last Adam. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 7.22. It's just good for you to have your eyeballs on these parts of the Bible so that you remember where they are and what they say. Hebrews 7.22. He's talking about Christ being a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek came before Levi. Of course, the argument that the writer of the Hebrews is combating is this idea that Jesus can't be qualified to be a high priest because he came from the tribe of Judah and not from the tribe of Levi. And everybody knows that True priests are Levitical priests. And the argument that the writer of the Hebrews makes is the same argument that's made by the psalmist is that he comes from a different line of priests. He comes from the line of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek blessed Abraham while Levi was still in the loins of Abraham. Levi was just a little bit of seed in Abraham when Melchizedek took a priestly role in blessing Abraham on behalf of God. And he's saying, and... You'll notice if you go back to Genesis, Melchizedek just disappears off the scene. There's no recorded death. The writer of Hebrews, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, looks back at that and talks about this is a priest whose days have no end. The Levitical priest, they keep on dying. Melchizedek, he never died. Jesus is a priest like Melchizedek. He's a better priest than the Levitical priests. And so he's making this argument, and he says in verse 22, therefore, in chapter 7, this makes Jesus the guarantor, the surety of a better covenant. This is a really important term when we start talking about covenant theology. A surety is one who assumes the responsibility of meeting all of the legal obligations of another party. That in a sense, they become that party's representative. Their head, so to speak. And so... As the last Adam was the head of his people, Christ is now going to become the head of his own redeemed people. And in so doing, in becoming surety, in becoming their head, their representative, as a great second Adam, he's willingly committing to doing four things. That's on your handout. We see, first of all, he's going to assume Adam's human nature with all of its present infirmities, yet without sin. Secondly, He's going to do what Adam failed to do by fulfilling the demands of the law through his obedience. Thirdly, he's going to bear Adam's penalty by exhausting the curse of the law, by offering himself as an atoning sacrifice in their place. And fourthly, after earning forgiveness of sins and eternal life for his people, he now applies to his people the benefits of their salvation through the power of the Holy Spirit the spirit who ultimately regenerates, the spirit who seals, the spirit who unites us to Christ when we come to believe in him by the grace of God. That after earning those forgiveness, that forgiveness, Christ now sends his spirit to apply the very benefits that he's earned by virtue of his life, death, and resurrection to those whom he and the Father have agreed to save in the covenant of redemption. But there's not just requirements, there's also promises. The requirements are placed on the Son, but the promises are given by the Father to the Son. And there's six of them at least. That through the Holy Spirit, the Father would prepare for the Son a human body fit for His work as surety and head, yet without sin. We see that Mary was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 10.5, we see that there as well. The Father promised, secondly, to endow the Son with all of the necessary gifts and grace to succeed in His work by giving Him the Spirit. As He says in John 3.34, the Spirit without measure. That everything that Jesus Christ did in His earthly ministry and all of His obedience all the way to the point of death on the cross was done in the power of the Spirit without measure. And so the Father is, I will support you I will ensure your success in this mission and I will do so by empowering you and anointing you by the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, the Father promised to support the Son in His work and to deliver Him from death 
and to enable him to destroy sin and Satan and establish his kingdom. You see those verses there. You can look these up on your own time and to your own edification. Fourthly, the Father promises to enable the Son as a reward for his work, to send the Holy Spirit to apply all of the benefits of salvation to his people. Fifthly, the Father would reward the Son a people from every nation. Ultimately, what the son is after, the ultimate reward he's looking for is twofold. It is a people that the father has promised him, an elect people, a people of his own inheritance. And secondly, that the father would endow and reward the son with all power in heaven and on earth for the government of the world and for his church. And as mediator, he would come to possess once again the glory that he possessed with the father before the foundations of the world. Those are the rewards that the Father has promised the Son should he be successful in his mission, successful in fulfilling the terms of the covenant. Any questions on any of that before we dive into a couple other important passages? Any questions about promises or requirements? Okay, so we've established that there is an agreement between the Father and the Son, a mutual agreement whereby the Father sets the conditions and the Son willingly agrees to those conditions. And this is being done in one single will according to the decree of God in eternity past. That's why we looked at all those passages, that this was something that had happened in eternity past, before the foundation of the world. All of this interaction between the Father and the Son is occurring and is now taking place in history through the covenant of grace. Turn to Isaiah 53. And let's see if we can't drill this down a little bit more. Isaiah 53. Common Old Testament passage. Most quoted Old Testament reference in the New Testament. Isaiah 53. We're going to pick it up in verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. And when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring and he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death. It was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. We see in verse 10 that the Lord has set himself to crush his servant and to put him to death. That this purpose had been laid out at some time in the past, which we know to be prior to the foundations of the world, according to other passages. But in laying down his life for his people, look at what the servant is going to do. As a result, verse 10, the servant is going to see his offspring. That is, Messiah, Jesus Christ, is going to end up seeing all of those whom the Father has promised him, all of those for whom he has laid down his life, he will end up seeing them. Of course, the question becomes, how in the world does somebody who's dead see his offspring? The answer is, he's got to be not dead anymore. He lays down his life and he's living again. That's why it says that he shall prolong his days. Not only that, verse 10, but the will of the Lord is to prosper in his hand. Or to, <clears throat> the will of the Lord is going to prosper in his hand. What is the will of the Lord? It is that counsel of redemption, the purposes of God, decreed in eternity past to save to himself a covenant people for the glory of the name of the Son. And the will of the Lord, that will shall prosper in the hand of the servant. 
But not only that, he is going to, verse 11, see and be satisfied. Verse 11 again, he is going to end up redeeming his offspring. And how's he gonna do it? By bearing their iniquities and making them to be counted as righteous. And that's why in verse 12, he is gonna receive a great portion. A portion like a conquering victor. He's gonna be rewarded and he's gonna be magnified for his obedience. Of course, what does the Apostle Paul say in Philippians chapter two of this servant? Go with me, Philippians chapter two. Paul is trying to build up into them attitudes, attitudes to count others more significant than themselves, the kind of attitudes that are humble attitudes that are not ultimately concerned merely with their own interests, but the interest of others, verse four. And he wants them to have this mind among themselves, which is also in Christ Jesus. If your ESV Bible says, which is yours in Christ Jesus, that's probably not the best interpretation, but you should see a little number two there and a better translation in a footnote, which was also in Christ Jesus, meaning this attitude that I'm exhorting you to, this was Jesus's attitude. You are in Christ, and so his attitude should be your attitude and let me just kind of let me just tell you exactly how this manifested itself this attitude of humility because this Christ that even though he was in the very form of God that is the very essence of God he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to in other words as God very God as co-eternal with the Father and the Spirit, he is deserving of all praise and honor and glory forever and ever and ever, amen. And yet he was willing to relinquish those rights for the sake of, as he says here, emptying himself, not emptying himself of his divinity, emptying himself of all of the rights that belong to him as God truly God. that he has emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and then he goes even lower, being born in the likeness of uh, men. Verse eight, and being found in human form, he goes even lower. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see all of the fulfillment of this covenant language, that he has been sent and willingly came to be perfectly obedient to all of the demands of the law and obedient all the way to the point of exhausting the very curses of the law for the elect. And it's because of that obedience, because of his fulfilling of this mission, because of the fulfilling of the requirements of the, of the covenant that he has made with the Father and the Spirit in eternity past that he is, verse nine, therefore rewarded. And I want you to think Isaiah 53, 12. Remember, Isaiah 53, 12, the servant is now as a result of his laying down his life, gathering to himself an offspring by bearing iniquities and making them to be counted as righteous. He now has a great portion as a conquering victor and he is rewarded and he is magnified. Here he has been obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, verse nine, therefore, because of his obedience, here's the consequence. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. This is what theologians have referred to as the super exaltation. And of course what we see here is the very pattern of the gospel that we see Jesus teaching, don't we? Those who want to be first have to be what? have to be last. Those who want to live have to what? Have to die. He's just living what he preaches and has, as he's covenant with the Father to do, from eternity past. This has always been his attitude and it's always been his intention according to the glorious decree of God and the covenant of redemption to save for himself a redeemed people. One more text. Go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, I don't know if it gets any more clear than this. The Gospel of John chapter 10. 
It's the famous good shepherd passage. He says, I'm the door, I'm the gate, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, he says, verse 11. That's why I'm so much different than a hired hand. He says, when wolves come, when death is at the door, hired hands, when they know they ain't getting another paycheck, they cut and run. I don't cut and run. I will lay down my life for the sheep because I'm a good shepherd. I'm not like Israel's leaders. And look at what he says in verse 17 and 18. He says, there is going to be one flock and there is going to be one shepherd. Who is that one flock? It is all of those redeemed by the blood of Christ who have come by God's grace to repent and believe in Christ who are members now of the covenant of grace. One flock made of all nations, including Israel. One shepherd, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 17, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Notice, the reason the Father loves him is not because he lays down his life. The reason the Father loves him is because he would take it up again. That is to the glory of the Father. Simply dying is to the glory of the Father. Dying and defeating death, that's to the glory of the Father. And then he goes on. No one takes it from me, he says, but I lay it down of my own accord. It is willing. It's not under compulsion. It's not as Friedrich Schleiermacher said, the wheels of history were turning and Jesus just couldn't run fast enough. He laid it down on his own accord, willingly, my decision, because I have, he says, verse 18, the authority to lay it down. And I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. Bounce down to John uh, 10, 27. He says, continues, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. By the way, he's talking about why is it that all these people aren't believing in him? Why, why are all these religious leaders if, if he is, in fact, who he says he is in relation to the Old Testament law, why are the experts of the Old Testament law not seeing him as that? Answer, because they're not of my sheep. They don't hear my voice. They don't know my name, and so they don't follow me. But he says in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Which, by the way, when you get to the end of the Gospel of John, I love this. I just, this is just an aside. You don't have to go there. Uh, Remember when you have Mary Magdalene and she goes and she sees Jesus, she sees the empty tomb and then she turns around and she sees a gardener and she's all confused and she doesn't know who he is. Jesus, according to the passage, doesn't change his appearance. What is it that all of a sudden makes Mary Magdalene, the sinner of all people, know that this is the shepherd? Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, my sheep hear my voice. I know them by name. All he had to say was her name, and he knew this is the voice of the shepherd. He says in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them, because I have the authority to do so, eternal life. And they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, oh, he's greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And I, the Father, are one. In other words, that's double omnipotence, securing the saints. But there's a few things that I want you to notice. That in these handful of verses, the Father has given the Son no less than three things. In verse 18, he's given the Son authority. That is, that he has the authority to carry out the responsibilities that has been laid upon him by the Father, the responsibilities that Christ has willingly taken upon himself, specifically to lay down his life and to bring it up again. And this responsibility to lay down his life and to bring it up again is, secondly, a charge that the Father has given him. So the Father has given him authority. Verse 18, again in verse 18, the father has given him a charge. What is that charge? You go lay down your life and you bring it up again. And I'm gonna give you the authority to do it. And the father gives him one other thing according to verse 29, what is it? You see it? Yeah, he's given my people to me. 
You earned it. Here they are. I gave you a charge and I gave you the authority to fulfill it and the power of the Holy Spirit. You did just that. You laid down your life. You have picked it up and these are those whom I am giving to you because of your faithfulness to the covenant that we've made with one another in eternity past. The Father gives him authority, gives him charge, and gives him a people. When did he do that? Before the foundations of the world, the covenant of redemption. What he was going to do was revealed partially all the way throughout the Old Testament according to the mystery of Christ as this promised covenant of grace. The covenant of redemption in history is promised in further steps until, boom, it's fully revealed and ratified in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And all of the elect from all ages that were given to him by the Father in eternity past, all of the elect are given to him because in the power of the Spirit, he fulfilled the requirements of the covenant. And so when did Christ receive it? Before the foundation of the world. What was Christ given to fulfill? Authority. Authority to do what specifically? To willingly lay down his life and to take it up again. And what was Christ's reward for fulfilling the charge given to him by the Father? Christ is given, the, given a people by the Father and he gives those people eternal life. That is the covenant of redemption. So having said all of that, I wanna go back to the very, it's like your first or second page, this isn't on there, but I just, I wanna run through these verses again. I've got them all here, Ephesians 3, 2 Timothy 1, because I want all of this language to have new meaning to you. I want you to hear things in there that maybe you didn't hear before, such that you'll never unhear it and you'll never be able to unsee it. Ephesians 3, 11, Paul is there unfolding the mystery of what he says, quote, is the eternal purpose that God has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. 2 Timothy 1.9, God has, quote, saved us and called us, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ, when? Before the ages began. Titus 1.2, this eternal life that according to John 10, he gives to his people, the people whom the Father has given to him, this eternal life was something, quote, that Paul says, which God promised before the ages began. 1 Peter 1, 8 to 9, or 1, 18 to 19. We see there the believers were redeemed. Redeemed with what? Redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. But this Christ was, quote, foreknown before the foundations of the world. By the way, it's important that it is his messianic title that was foreknown before the foundations of the world. It is Christ, Christos, that was foreknown. It's the one who would fulfill all of the types and shadows of the Old Testament, the one that would come to fulfill all of the requirements of the law and the one who would exhaust all of its curses. That is Messiah. And that Messiah, that Christ, was known before the foundations of the world. It just happens to be the case, Peter says, that he's been made manifest in these last days for your sake. Of course, who is the you? Well, it's the elect that has been promised to the Son by the Father in eternity past in the covenant of redemption. And then finally, in Revelation 13, 8, the Apostle John follows in the same train of thought as Peter by perceiving the Redeemer as a lamb that is, quote, slain before the foundation of the world. How is it that a redeemer who was slain in history, in Rome, or Jerusalem rather, how was he slain before the foundations of the world? Because the covenant of grace is the covenant of redemption in history, and the covenant of redemption is the covenant of grace in eternity. It was already promised and arranged it was as good as done. Because the Father made requirements of the Son, the Son willingly entered in to fulfill those requirements, and the Father gave the Spirit to the Son to make sure that he could not fail, the Spirit without measure. That is the covenant of redemption, according to covenant theology. Any questions or comments about any of that? It can be questions you have, things you're confused about that you 
just, it would be helpful for you to just talk it out a little bit. We still have about 20 minutes left. And I'll get to application here in just a minute. But just about the content that we've talked about this far. Or just things where, man, you, maybe you've never heard this before and you just feel like this was just particularly edifying. It'd be helpful for you to say it out loud for the edification of others. By the way, brothers and sisters who are online, feel free to jump in if you have any questions or comments on anything that we've talked about thus far. Yeah, and how do we know that Mary would respond positively to Jesus when he spoke his name? Because the Father had given him Mary. Yeah. How would you maybe like navigate a conversation with the obedience, like the requirements? Because um, I know some people would, would take that to be that's a great question he asks yeah the question is how would we understand the obedience of the son to the father and does the obedience of the son to the father mean that the son has somehow been eternally subordinated to the father there is a common and popular teaching on the Trinity that's risen over the course of the last maybe 20 or 30 years. It's risen in concert with the rise of theological complementarianism. Of course, you know, complementarianism is all about the relationship of men and women and authority and headship and those kinds of things. And what ESS, eternal submission of the Son, or EFS, eternal functional submission of the Son, is saying is that the Son has always had a submissive relationship to the Father for all of eternity. And what Rowdy is asking is, how, does, how do we avoid, by the way, this is, let me tell you why this is problematic. Because if the Father has a will and the Son is eternally subordinate, to that will, then that means that the Son has a will that is separate from the Father. You say, well, that doesn't sound so bad. The problem with this is that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from eternity past only have one divine will. It is undivided as God is undivided. We don't have time to get into this. It's what the old theologians refer to as simple. God is not made up of parts because the minute that you divide something into parts, the whole becomes dependent on the parts to be what it is. And because God is independent, that is dependent upon nothing, he cannot be divided up into parts. Otherwise, that would make God dependent upon his parts to be God. And so the minute that you divide the Father's will from the Son's will, you've now divided the, the Trinity into a three-slice pizza, essentially, or a two-slice pizza. You might be able to say the Spirit and the Father share a will, but the Son has a subordinate will that is separate to, but in concert with the Father. But insofar as God cannot be divided into pieces, his will cannot be divided into pieces, which is why you've heard me explaining over and over and over ad nauseum that it was not that the Father said to the Son, you gotta do this, and the, father, and the Son did so under compulsion. It's that the Son did so willingly. It was a mutual agreement between the Father and the Son, distinct persons in one Godhead, according to the one shared will of God that is undivided and eternal. Does that make sense? Meaning that the Father and the Son share one will, one decree, and that decree is informing the covenant of redemption and it cannot be divided any more than God himself can be divided because the minute that you divide God, God now becomes dependent on those parts to be God and God cannot be dependent on anything. That makes sense? That's the doctrine of simplicity. Divinity is not necessarily, is not God. 
Right, and why can't the divinity be gone? Because of what we just said. God can't be divided, can he? The son can't be fractured from the father and the spirit in terms of his essence. What would you say Philippians 2 is a good place to go to to hopefully maybe understand what are the things that he's actually Yes. Yes, so I believe what he's emptying in Philippians 2. He's asking in Philippians 2 then, how do we understand what he's emptying and things like that? I would understand what he's emptying not to be the essence of Godhood. I don't think there's any fracture or division that takes place in God through the incarnation. The mystery of the incarnation is that you have one God, well, that, we'll do a capital G just to be orthodox. You've got one God with one will. But then you have, oh, how do we want to put it? The God-man has two wills. This is essentially what's called Chalcedonian orthodoxy. It's the Council of Chalcedon. What they're concerned with doing is answering the question, how is it that, that Christ can become a man and still remain God? Well, God is indivisible, so Christ always shares one will with the Father and the Spirit from a journey past because God can't be divided. He's simple. He can't be comprised of parts. And yet, in the incarnation, in his full human nature, he took a will that subordinated itself to the Father to the one will and decree of the Father that he had decreed with the Father in eternity past. That's why when you get to the Garden of Gethsemane, what does Jesus say in his weakness and in his frailty, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but whose will? Your will. He's not speaking as the pre-eternal, co-glorious uh, Son of God who has been with the Father, who is God, He's speaking there as the God-man who is looking down the barrel of what he's about to suffer at Calvary and he goes, my human will submitted to that will, that will which we have shared from eternity past in this, in this glorious decree whereby we govern all things. Does that make sense? And this is what has been just called the hypostatic union. It's a mystery um, the minute that you try to try to unravel all of that, this is just the way that it is sometimes in the Bible. Calvin was, was famous with saying it this way, that the minute that we try to go beyond the Bible and trying to wrap our minds around all of this mystery, uh, we're gonna end up lost in the darkness. That God, according to his wisdom, has given us boundaries in his word and we can't go any further than that. Calvin's point is that essentially when the road of scripture runs out, you don't keep going, you fall to your knees and you worship because God is incomprehensible. What do you mean by incomprehensible? You mean that God's not knowable? Well, no, that's not what we mean. We can know God. What it means to say God is incomprehensible is that we can't know God as God knows God and that we're completely dependent on God to know anything about God. And he has not given us all that is possible to know about himself. Which means that if we think that we've ever arrived at a point where we can circumscribe God by our own reason, it is not God that we are worshiping. It is a God of our own creation because God is transcendent and incomprehensible. And so we just look at it and we go, okay, we have one will shared by the Father, Son, and Spirit as one true God for all of eternity, and yet in the incarnation, the Son has subordinated himself to that will, and his human will is in perfect submission to that will all the way to the point of death, even death on a cross, and he was successful because he was filled in his incarnation with the Spirit beyond measure. Does that make sense? By the way, the very same Spirit that you and I have been given to put sin to death and to walk faithfully in this life. Does that answer your question? Does that answer your question? Any follow-ups? Any follow-ups for you on that? EFS, ESS? You're good? Was that not helpful? No, it was helpful. Okay. Yeah, listen, the, the challenge with ESS and EFS, with eternal submission of the Son, is that it ultimately drifts into tritheism. And this is what many theologians have referred to as social trinitarianism. And the minute that you go, in, which means that there's three gods, but the three gods aren't necessarily one God, not in the way that the church has confessed through the ages. And if there's three gods and not one God, then we're not worshiping the God of the Bible. 
And if it's not the God of the Bible, then the God that you're talking about, this social trinity that has three wills and three persons, is a God that is impotent to save you, and he's unworthy of your worship. The only way that Christ is qualified to save those whom he has covenanted to save in eternity past with the Father, those whom the Father will give him, the only way that he's qualified to do that is if he is God, very God, one with the Father, undivided, co-equal, co-eternal, co-glorious for all of eternity. Other than that, he could not possibly be the appropriate mediator between God and man and from man to God. It would be inadequate altogether. And so the reason this came about is because you've got a group of theologians that are really, really concerned with establishing complementarianism in the church and the home and for some in, in society where men have certain roles and authority that's been given to them by God. I think that's good and biblical. That, that wives are to submit. And in a culture that's very hostile to that idea, they go, well, how can we ground this theological idea of complementarity between a man and a woman uh, in a way that becomes more doxological and worshipful. And the answer they came up with was, well, look, the son is always submitted to the father. How glorious is it for the woman to submit to the man if the son is always submitted to the father? What a glorious role to play. And the answer is, by starting with your complementarianism and moving backwards to your theology proper, you've now made improper inferences to God and have made God into something that is not what the church has historically confessed to be true about God. If you wanna talk about complementarity in the church, submission and headship and things like that, what you need to ground it in is not the doctrine of God. What you need to ground it in is in the doctrine of creation. That's where Jesus goes and that's where Paul goes. The minute that you try to form these kind of analogous relationships between us and God, it will never be us that gets messed up in the analogy, it'll always be God. That we take God for what he has revealed himself to be in his word and we don't go any further than that. And if you wanna work backwards as they did and you arrive at a conclusion that is contrary to what the Bible teaches as historically confessed by the church, then you gotta back up and you gotta do your theology all over again because you've drifted now into severe error and potentially even heresy. By the way, those who have affirmed it, just so you know who we're talking about, are big names, Wayne Grudem, Bruce Ware, um, Owen Strawn, who serves now at Midwestern Theological Seminary, Denny Burke, who has been a little bit more strong and maybe not affirming it, moving away from it, but not so explicitly. And many of them are all tied to this Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood who has grounded their whole theological edifice in this idea of Trinity. And so you pull that pin out and the whole thing falls apart. And so there's a lot at stake for them in their theological agenda. And they're godly guys, they're faithful guys overall. I just think they're in severe error when it comes to the Trinity with the risk of drifting into heresy contrary to Nicaea and Chalcedon, the councils of the past. Sorry, that was a huge excursus. But now you know. Let me just get into a few applications. Why does it matter? By the way, your question, Rowdy, was my first application. But I thought, eh, nobody's going to be interested in that, and I deleted it. So, thank you. Number one, the covenant of redemption teaches us about the love of God. Thomas Goodwin says this, there was never such joy in heaven as upon this happy conclusion in agreement. The whole trinity rejoiced in it. The covenant of redemption. Brother and sister, you realize that the Father doesn't love you because Christ died for you. Christ died for you because the Father loves you. And he has loved you from eternity past. And too many of us have an errant idea of a Jesus who has become incarnate and died on the cross and has now revealed this God of grace but is somehow holding back the God of wrath from just incinerating us. The covenant of redemption says no, the God of love, the God who is also a God of wrath has set his love upon you from before the foundations of the world. And he sent his son to become incarnate and to die in your place, not so that he could love you, but because he has loved you for eternity. 
So it teaches us about the love of God. So Christ's work doesn't ultimately persuade or obligate an otherwise angry or reluctant father to love you. Instead, the father's electing love for you is expressed and it is revealed in the mystery and the life and the incarnation and the death and the resurrection and the ascension and exaltation of his son and is now being poured out into your hearts by the Holy Spirit, Romans 5. It helps us understand and know and experience the love of God better. Secondly, it provides us with assurance and comfort that you are a Christian today not because you've somehow made yourself lovely to God. You were chosen in the Son before you ever did anything good or bad. God has chosen you according to his own free will in his eternal decree that is worked out in the covenant of redemption. And so if you're a Christian today, it is because before the foundations of the world, Christ mentioned your name to the Father. That's who I want. And the Father, in return, it said, listen, I will give them to you as a reward for your obedience. All that the Father has given me, I won't lose one. And the reason that no one can snatch you out of his hand is because the Father has given you to him and the Son and the Father are one. One will, one purpose, one decree, one covenant, ultimately accomplished and fulfilled in the work of Christ and his incarnation such that he who has laid his love on you from eternity past has now won you for eternity future in history through the work of Christ. And then the last one, a little random, but I'm following John Flavel here. It guards us against grumbling. Show of hands, any grumblers here? I'll just raise two. Yep. John Flavel, a Puritan pastor and theologian, provided a hypothetical dialogue of this eternal covenant in order to help Christians stop complaining when they find it hard to obey Christ. That's like varsity level, pastor. How do I get my people to stop grumbling and complaining? I'm gonna exhort them with the covenant of redemption. <laughs> but this is what he says. It's a, like I said, a hypothetical dialogue in the eternal covenant between the Father and the Son. The Father says, my son, here is a company of poor miserable souls that have utterly undone themselves and now lie open to my justice. Justice demands satisfaction for them or will satisfy itself in the eternal ruin of them. What shall be done for these souls? The son responds, O oh, my father, such is my love to and pity for them that rather than they shall perish eternally, I will be responsible for them as their guarantee Bring all your bills that I may see what they owe you. Lord, bring them all in that there may be no after reckonings with them. At my hand, you will require it. I would rather choose to suffer your wrath than they suffer it, Philippians 2. Upon me, my father, upon me be all their debt. The father responds, but my son, if you undertake for them, you must pay the last penny. Expect no discounts. If I spare them, I will not spare you. The son responds, I am willing, Father. Let it be so. Charge. Charge it all to me. I am able to pay their debt. And though it will undo me, though it will impoverish all of my riches and empty all of my accounts, yet I am content to undertake it. I think this is ultimately why the author to Hebrews says that the son was willing to endure 
the shame of the cross, not Hebrews, but endure the shame of the cross for the reward that was set before him, the joy that was set before him. What is that joy? It's the very reward that the Father has promised him. Why so much joy and so much suffering? And the answer is you. Because he considered you more important than himself. Flavel's point was to remind us that when we consider the son's voluntary decision to s save sinners at the expense of his own dignity and life, <laughs> who are we who are in Christ? Who are we to grumble about anything? Have this attitude in you which is also in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we can't even come close to understanding how much you love us in Christ. And we sing songs that say that you have no less love for us than you have for him, and yet we can't fathom how much love you have for him. And yet it is an eternal love, an inexhaustible love, a free, independent love, a sovereign love a love that is indestructible and unquenchable and eternal and undefiled and pure and holy and it knows no bounds and it knows no limits and that is the love with which you love us now that we are in Christ. And that is the love with which you have loved us from eternity past, from before the foundations of the world according to the purposes that you have set forth and now accomplished in your son Jesus. Father, help us to love you more. Help us to obey you more. Help us to love others more. Help us to treasure Christ. And I pray that you would open our eyes to these and many other passages such that we would never be able to unsee what we've seen here tonight to the glory of your praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have any other questions, you can feel free to ask or make comment, anything that you felt was helpful. Those of you who are still lingering with us on the screen, feel free to jump in. Um, I also know it's nine o'clock, so if you wanna take off, then our time's up. You can feel free to do that. I know many of you have obligations, family members at home, uh, but I'm willing to spend just a few extra minutes if there's any other questions or comments. Um, let's turn to the guys on, on screen. You guys, any questions, comments, anything that you would like further explanation on or anything that you just found particularly edifying that's worth repeating? Will you all think about it? Anybody left here? Anybody? Thoughts, comments, questions? David? Huh? So as a person, maybe someone else here is the same way, but just this person has a lot of either friends or actually probably family members that probably fall into our mini inside of thinking about things. Yeah. sure before I forget everything you're saying let me repeat it that's okay what David is asking is how do we take some of these things that we're learning or have come to believe and how do we interact on these things with people who maybe don't believe the same those who might be be contrary to covenant theology or Calvinism those who you you said might be more Arminian perhaps I think the first thing you'll notice like in our own church one of the things that we try to leave behind is we just don't use any of those labels right all of that just has so much baggage. So when I say Calvinism and I open that luggage, what I pull out is a bunch of stinky stuff that doesn't look anything like biblical Calvinism. Same thing with Reformed theology. So we don't call ourselves a Calvinist church or a Reformed church. What I'm interested in doing first and foremost is I just wanna teach the Bible. I just wanna talk about the Bible. And I think the Bible naturally leads us here if you read and think and interpret and teach the Bible well, such that many people 
back into to it, and after, after some time, time months, years, years maybe, maybe go, go, wait a minute. So, so like, that's covenant theology? That, that's what, that, that's Calvinism? That, that's Reformed theology? Yeah, that's what I believe. You, does that make sense? I just, there's just so much le- baggage with the labels that I just want to toss that up. Oh, so you're an Arminian? Let me tell you why I'm a Calvinist, right? Yeah. My two exhortations to you would be this. Before you are a Calvinist or before you're Reformed or before you're anything else, be a Bible guy. Love the Bible. This is why we spent most of our time just in the Bible. Be a Bible guy. Secondly, if the sovereign electing grace of God has made you more proud to where you boast in things that are not ultimately Christ, which may be your theology about Christ, but not Christ himself, then you don't understand the sovereign electing grace of God. It is meant to humble and reduce us and to make us so humble that when we look at those, even those with whom we differ, we go, (laughs) it's not like I brought anything to the table. This has all been God's grace. And so I just, be humble and loving. I think that's what the doctrine of election is meant to do, to strengthen us and humble us not to make us proud and be a Bible guy. Just open the Bible. Talk with them from the Bible. What do you do with this? Just let it linger there, you know? And be patient. Be patient. Um, I'd say most people as a pastor, a lot of people through the years that I come in contact with have a lot of ideas and misshapen ideas and they were either not equipped very well, they weren't taught well, by other pastors, where they were taught, I think, sometimes wrong things by other pastors, such that, um, well-intentioned pastors, such that they think they know what they're talking about, but they don't. So I just wanna be exceedingly patient, exceedingly patient and kind and gentle. And if I can't prove it from the Bible, it's not worth believing, so.